let's see how much time we have for this panel. So we go until uh, 15.30, perfect. 25 minutes. All right, so it's me again, Stefan. I'm also still the founder and steward and architect at Flashbots. Um, I'll put my other hat on, which is one of trying to design a, um, uh, an auction system and, a, and a, maybe I should say a, a, a block building system that is uh, compatible with, um, with Ethereum um, and the goals that Ethereum has longer term. So the way I'll, I'll frame this conversation is um, right now we live in a paradigm where block building is happen happening at the same place as validating is happening. So for, um, for miners right now on Ethereum, right, they have the task of collecting transactions, collecting bundles from various different sources like Flashbots, like, uh, like Blockstrout, um, and, and putting them together into a block and then also doing the whole thing that you know miners do where they, they mine for a hash, uh, submit a proof of work and then propagate that to the network. Uh, Vitaly gave a talk earlier today, which was about uh, the future of, of MEV within the, the uh, protocol level of, of Ethereum. And one of the key objectives is separating out this role of block construction, of, of block building from the role of validating. So uh, taking this, uh, this task of assembling transactions together into a block, letting specialized parties um, uh, uh, build on this, and, um, and limiting the role of, of validators to, uh, to, to the proposal and, and, and the voting on top of these, these blocks. Um, so I'll go one by one here and, and we'll do a name and, and where you work and then also after that I'll, I'll, guide, a, I'll guide a discussion into, into block building. Hi, I'm Tim, I work at Infira. Uh, I'm an engineer there. I've been there for three and a half years now, so a pretty long time for uh, the company. Um, I've worked on a lot of things during that time. Uh, over the past few years, I've mostly led the addition of all our new networks. Uh, so that's been support on Infira for everything from Filecoin to the Layer 2 networks now that you hear so much about, uh, and it's only growing. Hi, Eyal. Can you hear me? Yeah. Eyal Markovic, co-founder in Bloxar. Uh, hi, I'm Tomasz Stanczak. I work as a product manager at Flashbots Relay and uh, also worked on the protocol development on Ethereum uh, with Nethermind client. Okay, um, Tomasz, I'll start with you. Um, can you talk a bit about the unique challenge of, of block building and uh, how you sort of see the block building ecosystem uh, uh, sort of evolve and what, what types of players maybe will be, will be doing block building in the future? Yeah, sure. I think that um, what we started by introducing uh, Flashbots to the proof of work systems uh, was because we noticed that uh, there are already some problems. There were already some problems with uh, block building. We needed to avoid the potential risks of um, of the private arrangements between the searchers and miners. We wanted to make sure that the access to MEV is democratized. And now, when we look at the proof of stake. Uh, those those risks might be uh, much much more uh, serious because of leading to centralization of the of the stake cache. So the big operators of uh, of staking might be might be the ones that will uh, simply cause all the solo miners, the solo validators, to uh, to not have enough space. Um, so they this. Uh, Risk of centralization, as uh, I think was mentioned by Vitalik many times, is one of the main challenges for, for Ethereum after the merge. Uh, and for the block builders, the challenges themselves is like to how to participate in that, um, in that uh, drive, making everything properly decentralized. Uh, how to avoid the pressure of central uh, pressure of Mm, sorry, uh, pressure of censorship of the transactions. Uh, how to collect uh, all the all the mempool transactions? How to collect proper transactions to build valuable blocks and uh, and really take that role? And this may require a lot of specializations, lots of skills uh, of knowing how to merge different transactions, how to prioritize things, how to. Uh, how to really simulate that in a very, very fast way. And uh, that skill, again, uh, there is a risk that the builder itself becomes the centralization uh, factor, that the builder requires so much skills that 
uh, that is a risk by itself in the in the MEV world. So balancing all of those uh, centralization factors, the centralization uh, requirements, censorship resistance is, is a challenge. Okay, Eyal, question for you about block building. Um, this is not a role really that exists right now, but projecting into the future, what do you think are sort of the differences between a block builder that's going to be most successful and one that isn't? So maybe another way to, to, to frame this question is what would make one block builder more competitive to, than another or, or better than another? So, it's a great question. So I think it's, it's uh, in a sense, you have to think who's, what's going to be the advantages, what's, what's going to be the gain. So obviously the first, the first thing is, uh, uh, is getting, getting the information faster. Okay, so the one that are going to optimize their infrastructure, the one that are going to make sure that they hear about the, about the opportunities, about the transaction in general, and obviously the transaction with, uh, with MEV uh, faster, they are the one who are going to get the, the, uh, the gain, the advantage. So that's the first thing. There are going, there are going to be some, uh, some advantages uh, in simulation. So that's, uh, again, a, a lot of it is infrastructure, but a lot of it might be uh, uh, within the logic. But for my view, this is the, the things that uh, if, even if one uh, block builder will have an advantage, it's going to be very fast to, uh, to, imit to imitate. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the last thing is the, is the step of the execution, which uh, in a sense, I'm not that, uh, I'm not that uh, sure that there will be a performance problem here, but the, there might be, and we can see it in a different, uh, uh, in different chain where a validator are creating a block, but, uh, uh, but they're still being uncled and, uh, and they're losing the opportunity. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, Tim, um, so one of the big, I think, things around block building and potentially one of the big concerns is uh, censorship. Um, so if we sort of abide to a vision of the future where we do have uh, proposer builder separation, there might be a lot of economies of scales involved in, in block building, which means that there'll be much fewer block builders than there will be uh, validators in the network. Um, this is something where you can get in a scenario is where the block builders get all the transactions and, and can start making decisions around uh, should we include this transaction or not include it. I think Infura as being the largest aggregator of transaction um, for you know as long as I can remember on on Ethereum has had to like tackle a lot of these questions around you know how, what does it mean to be an aggregator of transactions and 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 how do we deal with it? So I want I want to hear a bit about um, about your understanding within Infura and how Infura thinks about sort of this role of being a custodian in the ecosystem of transactions and how that relates to censorship and, and, and some of the other characteristics that, that are a bit more undesirable. Uh, sure, so I mean, Infura's goal has always been to enable developers and enable Ethereum and the ecosystem to be successful. Uh, and we've had a lot of success. As you said, we're you know, probably the biggest transaction aggregator receiving all the transactions through MetaMask and other sources. Uh, we get a lot of them. And uh, mostly, we just are trying to keep up. Uh, you might think that our transaction infrastructure might have all sorts of craziness in there. We might you know, be doing order flow. We might be selling it to whoever. And of course, you have to take my word on this, but we're doing very, very little. Uh, <laughs> we're really just trying to take your transactions and propagate them out as best as we possibly can. Uh, and at the scale that we are, that is actually quite a huge challenge. And so we spend all our time really just trying to provide the best quality of service to users that we can. Uh, and we're not always perfect at that, of course. Um, as one interesting tidbit, you might imagine that the amount of transactions that we receive is maybe somewhere on the scale that go through Ethereum, right? You know, obviously there's going to be more because there's uh, ones that the gas price are too low, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in reality, we get many, many orders of magnitude more transactions than that. And so just dealing with that is an enormous challenge. Um, and uh, we're also just, we're in a very precarious position uh, in that uh, we have all this data, we wanna be responsible with it, we don't wanna do anything to hurt the network, to hurt our users. Uh, and so we, we move slowly in that regard, you know, so we're, we're hesitant to, you know, make any big changes to, to how we handle things, to 
you know, start sending transactions through some other mechanism than what we currently do, which is just through the P2P network right now. So, so, so one of the things, Al, that you brought up, right, the advantage of the block builder is the speed at which it receives information. Um, so searchers today and, and block builders in the future would obviously be willing to pay a lot to get access to this aggregated uh, set of transactions as quickly as possible. Um, this is a question for, for the whole panel. I want to hear what are your thoughts on what the future holds for Ethereum with regards to things like payment for order flow or exclusive order flow and how, how, how um, that could evolve. Well, that's a big topic. So uh, I think there is, um, there is a massive interest from the, from the industry to introduce solutions that would allow to, to monetize transaction flow, to uh, st start playing a um, very competitive game between the players. So if we hear now that uh, in Furious role now is to, to really look at the network as the health of the network, not, not interfering with it, um, I think there is a lot of appetite to, to change it in the future. And at the same time, from the core development perspective, uh, there is a push to prevent it uh, as much as possible, right? So we can think of the split between uh, nowadays world of mostly public mempools and, and all the path towards the private mempools, which uh, if we compare here the builders and potentially create uh, the ways of creating advantage as a builder, uh, and then whether it's a private order flow or payment for order flow, uh, this properly enables the, the builder centralization. Uh, so I think that's the dynamic of, uh, of the fight for public mempool, accessible mempool, uh, and the private order flow, payment for order flow, uh, will be an interesting game to look at and whether, whether we'll be approaching it from the perspective of uh, just economic models or, or maybe some cryptographic models. So introducing uh, properly private encrypted transactions. Um, I think if you if you listen to Justin Drake earlier today, this these are some solutions towards that, mm, and yeah, probably the next uh, two three years will be showing how how that uh, grows. Is the future of exclusive order flow and payment for order flow a good one? Is it a bad one? Is it somewhere in between? How how do we assess this? Yeah, it's uh, myself. I'm, I'm uh, in the interesting place of just constantly looking at those two two different paths, and uh, I'm wondering uh, if I look at them from the perspective of this market uh, payment for order flow markets creation, but also from the perspective of the core development. Uh, is it good or bad? Um, it might be unavoidable. It might be something very natural, and saying that uh, this is what the open market of transactions is. Uh, but if there is some very neat solution that is that is protecting everyone against uh, this isolation, separation of, of uh, transaction pools into multiple containers, uh, that would be great to introduce it. So, so probably the challenges on the cryptography, uh, cryptography research, um, that would be better. Uh, if the solutions are not neat and are just creating a, a very bad user experience, then probably we want it to, uh, to continue for a while to, to see how it plays by itself. Yeah, similar question around payment for order flow, exclusive order flow, maybe even preferential access. Maybe it's not about having exclusivity. It's just about you know, getting the transactions a few milliseconds before, before your competition. H how do you think about this? Okay, and that's my personal view. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's bad. In, it, it's, not some, it's not bad in the sense that we must prevent it. Okay, I can see use cases where it's good. For example, if this is benefits the user. So if it's, if it's for example, when a user submits a transaction, that's an option that the user can pick. And the user will say, I don't mind sending it to a specific uh, uh, a few builders, uh, giving them a few millisecond difference if they are going to pay me back this is not a bad thing for the user so i don't think uh, that we want to treat it as something that we must find a solution and, uh, and completely uh, avoid that's the first uh, that's the first thing second thing is i view that as an infrastructure issue okay so it's kind of like uh, some or at least uh, 
at least uh, some, some, some builder might pay, and maybe Bloxout will have some, some, uh, some solution around it, some might, might pay for a faster network to get some of the transaction. And that's gonna be a, a decision that uh, the, the builder as a user made, n can make a decision if they want to upgrade their network and get the uh, transaction faster, or they want to use the peer-to-peer -peer and get it, uh, uh, get it slower. The most important thing is that we are not, uh, we are not delivering uh, some transaction just to a few, uh, to a few builder because they are paying for the service. But everyone are getting the transaction. If somebody wants to pay to get them faster, that's that's kind of like, why am I running with SSD and not without this? Because I want to pay a little bit more and get faster performance. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on payment for flow, uh, well, flow flow? So I'm far from qualified to really have an opinion on this matter. Um, I really come from a web two infrastructure world and I do a lot of that in Fira. So to be honest, today for me has been learning about MEV and all these things. Uh, so I don't have an opinion, but what I like is that this conversation is happening. Um, I mean, these are things that exist just kind of by default in TradFi um, and, and people just kind of accepted them, but it's coming to the conversation with you know, situations like Robinhood and, and you have more people trading and then it's found out that like, oh, how does Robinhood make their money with zero commission trades? It's because they sell your order flow off to people, right? And so now people are starting to think about it and they're like, well, maybe, maybe we don't like that. Maybe we should come up with alternatives. And I think this space just has a lot more interest in conversation in, in reevaluating what we should do, which I like. So there's this, um, this idea or this concept of decentralized block building. Right, so we could be in a future in which um, a lot of the block building, a lot of transaction aggregation, the exploration and searching of MEV, and the block construction happens in an integrated, sort of vertically integrated manner. Um, and then an idea in which like, maybe there's a way to decentralize that, avoid a future in which a single entity is, is doing this entire pipeline and say it's an ecosystem of, of entities who, who are, are doing this entire pipeline. So my question is, like, if we believe that the future uh, will be brighter under a decentralized block building uh, future, what are the properties of the platform or what are the properties of the, of the, um, the system? Maybe you could say the, the market structure. What, what are the characteristics that it needs to have to, uh, to succeed? Um, I'll let anyone uh, pick up on that. Okay, I think... Um, we should keep thinking about the, the security of the network. Um, and not, not only from the decentralization perspective, also, also the fact that, um, that you, have end up, uh, sorry, you have to end up paying uh, proper rewards to, to validators, uh, miners for not so long more, but uh, validators for sure. So uh, there are many other risks of like, what, what will happen really with the with the borrowing yields versus the securing the system yields and and whether we'll build the tools to to protect us against it and the same thing will be with uh, with the block building so if all those dynamics will lead to the insecure system then we have to act very quickly we have to predict it we have to plan it and use whatever tools we can um, what other properties really for block building. I think we, we want to democratize it, right? So if, if we think that there is some value that should always be, uh, that, that will always be extractable, right? Like so simply uh, unavoidable uh, arbitrage, so misalignments of decentralized exchanges, um, the, the positions to be liquidated and so on. So all of those um, natural functions of arbitragers, of MEV extractors that are actually desired by the markets uh, should be uh, should be executed as fast as possible. Like you don't want to wait with liquidation for two blocks just because you introduce some mechanism that, that democratize it. Like liquidators want to, uh, want to execute fast and the protocols want liquidators to act as fast as possible because um, their protocols are at risk if not uh, liquidated quickly. Uh, so, so you have to have mechanisms that, that, satisfies, that satisfy those requirements. And uh, by democratization, I mean that anyone should be able without too much of the capital uh, allocation to, to build a builder, relatively efficient builder that, uh, that will enable that extraction. Decentralized in what way? Uh, probably through, again, through, through privacy, maybe some solutions using 
in the very distant future, the, the fully homomorphic encryption, uh, maybe in the short term, some hardware solutions like, like trusted execution environments. Yeah, I, I can continue. So I agree. I think the capitalization is, is key. Okay, if we want, if to make it success, we don't want to end up with, uh, with five uh, builders. We want to have thousands, we want to have hundreds. If we're going to end up with thousands and hundreds, we want to make sure that, as I said earlier, the, 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 the simulation, the process of building the, or proposing the, the block, building the block is uh, something that a thousand or hundred of builder can, uh, uh, can do. And the network, I fear, is going to become a bottleneck. Okay, we landed. We landed in Ethereum. Uh, uh, we landed. Uh, well, we're seeing it in Polygon with uh, hundred of uh, of validator and uh, and the block uh, block propagation started to become a become a, a a problem. We're seeing it in BSC. That's a huge huge mess. The network. And if the network will become a problem, guaranteed there are not going to be hundreds of uh, of uh, block. So we, we need to make sure that the infrastructure supports uh, uh, scaling in the, in, the, in the block builder and that will get, is gonna allow us to get to where we want, we want to, uh, to be. The good thing is, I think after the merge, we're not gonna be in a stage where we have hundreds of, uh, of uh, builders. So we can, we can approach it in this two stages. The first stage is let's just uh, let's just roll it out, learn from uh, le learn what is uh, broken, and fix it quickly. And I think that will allow us to get to where we want to be. I have personally two questions with regards to decentralized build, uh, block building, which which are at the top of my mind, and, and they're the ones that keep me up at night. One of them is how latency sensitive is the system? Like, is it feasible to believe that? there will be network communication in between the actors in this, in this pipeline, in this transaction supply chain? Or is the system so latency sensitive that the only way to go about it is to co-locate every single role next to each other in the same server rack? Um, so I wanna talk a bit about latency sensitivity and, and these systems and the direction that we see things going. Uh, yeah, so I could say something on this. I think in general, and with the previous question too, a lot of it comes down to the user experience and also educating the user. Um, so th there's always a lot of focus in crypto on, at the protocols and sort of the Web3 side. Uh, but if you send a transaction, uh, your choices are send it to, you know, Infura.io, uh, run your own node, send it to that directly, and then it gets gossiped by the peer-to-peer -peer network, or those are basically your only choices. Flash bus protect RPC. Right, right. Block so, RPCs. Right, but so exactly. It's still, it still is an endpoint, and you have to provide the user with a good experience to use that endpoint. And so you called out the MetaMask issue. Uh, and so I believe in MetaMask it is possible to set a custom RPC endpoint, but it's not a clear UX. It's not using the main net network like you would expect. And so we need to improve those user experiences so users have the options and the knowledge of how their transactions are going to be routed. Uh, and we also have to do things at the boring Web2 layer to make things work better. Uh, we can't necessarily rely on a peer-to-peer -peer network, which has you know, indeterministic behavior to propagate out your transaction to off the block builders responsibly. We maybe need to give uh, the user in where they first interact with the network, which is at the client, the ability to send the direction directly over the Web2 mechanisms that we know work and are secure, HTTPS, to multiple block builders that satisfy uh, their, their latency you know, requirements, their privacy requirements, et cetera. Um, so I think, I think some of these things are simpler to solve and they really just come down to user experience and design in that level. Maybe a final question as, as we're, we're running out of time. Um, the other question that I have about decentralized block building is will there only be five block builders or will there be hundreds or will there be thousands? And a, a big question for that is, in my mind is, you know, would it be feasible to just run an open source version of a block builder and remain competitive with, with all of the other block builders? Um, I think, you know, as, a, as, a, as an infrastructure provider, 
you guys have put a lot of time and investment into scaling your system to deal with just like the sheer load and, and, and you sort of mentioned this a bit. I think block builders will have to figure out this, um, this like immense amount of, of, of transaction throughput and how to deal with it. Is there a way to build this, this highly scalable infrastructure in a way that is, um, that is open source and in a way that many, many different actors can run? Or is that like a fundamental constraint on block building that, that will lead to centralization? Well, okay, so ignoring maybe the details of block building and assuming that uh, to run a block builder, it's gonna be similar to running an Ethereum node and having to scale that. Uh, I think it's really hard. Uh, I think that's why ex we exist. I think that's why we're successful. Uh, that said, um, we've always been thinking about how to decentralize the Infura experience of being able to uh, run your own RPC in a way that is easy, that can scale well. Uh, we are working very hard still on that idea. Um, and I think that will come into block building and just this whole ecosystem in general. Um, I think that a lot of the, you know, the, the nodes where you actually have to interact with them are just not designed with that true intent of making them easy for many people to run. And so we're trying to figure out how to do that. We hope we can figure it out. We hope that results in you know, tens of thousands of block producers, as you said, block builders, but we'll see. Yeah, if I think about it, the most, most probable scenario, um, there, are, there are multiple hints that would point at maybe a few, few block builders. Uh, so rather five, uh, if you are saying, is it five or 10 or 100? Uh, and also like coming back to, to payment for order flow, while we say that we maybe it might be undesired, again, there are many hints that suggest that this is also unavoidable path until, until we find some very, very powerful solutions. So again, this would strengthen this impression that there'll be just a handful of block builders. But now if we say that we have this very desired property of, of democratized extraction of MEV, then the question is, among those five builders, uh, will it be a builder that will be playing uh, for a specific actor and, and all the extraction will be for that actor or the builder will be actually representing uh, multiple users and the access to the builder uh, block creation will be somehow uh, democratized through the systems like Flashbots Relay and so on. Mm. And again, will there be some solution like, like MEV SGX? Uh, will MEV Boost support it enough uh, through the Flashbot system uh, to make sure that we won't be really too worried that it's, uh, that it's just five builders? Even uh, Vitalik's paper, The End Game, talks about just a handful of, uh, of builders and then really tries to address it like in the, in the future like this. Uh, can we really create a system that is still uh, satis uh, satisfactory for, for everyone? Uh, and and there we go a bit further. Like it's not only one chain, it's possibly a block builder that really looks at, at multi-domain MEV extraction. And, uh, and you can already imagine the complexity of the system grows, right? So, so the builder doesn't build only one block, but really looks at uh, multiple chains together and requires to have a very good understanding of the market, very good access to all the transactions that possibly are spanning uh, across multiple bridges, domains, and so on. Um, possibly we have to read all the, all the research uh, materials from Flashbots on, on multi-domain to, to get better understanding of this as well. All right, so um, we're out of time. Thank you so much to the panelists. Give a, a nice round of applause. And uh, yeah, just parting word for the audience. I think block building is just at the cusp and it's like a new entrant into the space. I expect it's something that we'll hear a lot more about and talk more about in the future. Um, so if you're, you're interested in, in some of the, the topics that we discussed here, uh, there's so many open questions. So thank you all for, for attending. Thank you so much.